Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Dan Powers, Executive Director of the Society for Science at User Research Facilities. And we're starting another session of our 2022 annual meeting. This is going to be a panel discussion regarding the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion themes in user facilities. We're fortunate to have three speakers today who will be describing their path in scientific world of research and their current involvement in user facilities and to touch on the, that theme that I've described really with uh, this kind of insight with some suggestions for what should be coming next, what should be top of mind, and really what should the scientific community know and continue to have discussions about when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and engagement of communities who may not have traditionally been involved in at least the United States research ecosystem in a historic sense. So before we bring on the speakers, let me give a little bit of a background. And I would like to thank Dr. Abram Ledbetter, who will not be joining us today, but was the organizer, really took the lead in helping to shape the theme of this conversation and invite the panelists to speak. The title that you would have seen is Lenses Shedding Light. And the intention there, really the theme is that by looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion through different perspectives, we can be more enlightened, uh, perhaps build on our natural curiosity and see things in a way that we have not noticed before and ideally help to build an even stronger fabric in the research university universe uh, research user facility ecosystem. So please let me welcome onto the screen then our speakers, and I will give you a brief, a brief background on each of them. Um, again, th this session is going to include this round table of these speakers sharing their experiences, perspectives, and insights relative to fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion within communities of scientific research at user research facilities specifically. So I'll start with Dr. Pat Tabitha Dobbins and hope everyone can come onto the screen here. Uh, Tabitha got to meet uh, almost coincidentally in person, it was so wonderful at a uh, conference just last week. And we were talking before we even knew who we were each talking to. Uh, I think that uh, spoke well to it, just a kind of instant rapport that we were able to strike up there. But Tabitha is an associate professor of physics and astronomy at Rowan University, where she also serves as the vice president for research. Her research investigates the relationship between structure and dynamics and composite materials using neutron and X-ray scattering with applications to modern engineering problems in carbon nanotubes, gold nanoparticles, the hydrogen fuel economy, and polymer self-assembly. She's currently serving by appointment on the Department of Energy's Basic Energy Sciences Advisory Committee. So thank you, Tabitha. Thanks for joining us. And we are also uh, being joined by Dr. Suman Kumar, uh, excuse me, Kuar. And hello, Suman. This is my first time meeting you. Thank you for joining us today. She is a research scientist and group leader at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, where she performs research on thermal, thermal energy storage. She's a material scientist and has background in material synthesis and characterization, as well as in various thermal me uh, metrologies. Her current research projects include development of dynamically tunable thermal energy storage, thermal switches, and standalone thermal batteries using thermochemical materials for low to medium temperature applications. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. And then we also have Dr. Melissa Sims. Hi. And uh, Melissa's connected with Brookhaven's NSLS2 and Livermore, Lawrence Livermore uh, National Labs Advanced Light Source. Hello, Melissa. Uh, Melissa is a research scientist also at John Hopkins University with a visiting scientist appointment at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, as I mentioned. She's completed bachelor's degrees in physics and geophysics at the College of Charleston and the University of South Carolina. Melissa has also completed her master's degree through a diversity program funded through INCREASE, that's the acronym, the NSF GEO, GEO Diversity Initiative at Stony Brook University. During her PhD, she examined 
Deformation and phase transformation during meteor impacts at strain rates relevant, relevant to cratering. And during her postdoc, she won an NSF EAR postdoctoral fellowship to expand her work into the shock regime using multiple in situ te techniques. Oh, thank you, Melissa. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to Everybody. then start the conversation. Think of this as a roundtable. I will prompt you with the questions that I know you've received before, so hopefully not catching you completely off guard. But uh, as I mentioned, with Abram's assistance, framing out this conversation for the next 45 minutes or so, uh, I'll just go, in essence, in the order that I initially introduced you. We'll go with, to Tabula, uh, Tabitha and then Sumar and over to Kim. But then we can really get more into a flow of the conversation. Uh, feel free to react to each other's comments, and we'll build on that through the questions that we have prepared. But let me start with, with you, Tabitha, and we'll ask each each of you, what was your entry point into science? Like, where did you begin to pursue science with intention? Uh, what were some of the factors that drove you or, or compelled you into science? Tabitha, to you. Yeah, so I had, as a high school student, I had two interests, music and science. I was a violinist and I thought I would become a concert violinist. And um, that that actually didn't happen. I, um, I went to an undergraduate uh, degree program at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. It's a historically black college uh, in um, southeastern Pennsylvania. And at the time, it had a, a scholarship and fellowship program that if I did well in the sciences, I would have my entire bachelor's degree paid for. This is the laser program uh, led by Dr. Willie Williams. That program was really my onboarding into the sciences, and uh, the, the, the program allowed for all of the degrees that were um, available, including mathematics, physics, chemistry, and so forth. I ultimately chose physics for it being the most uh, diverse and amenable to many career options. And then uh, that was my, my starting point. That's where I began to pursue with intention. And it was a great experience. All right. Thank you for that background. And Suman, how did you get into science? Uh, yeah, so I think for my journey, I, I was always a curious child. So, you know, I went into engineering, I studied metallurgy. So I like learning how the metals behave under different conditions and how you process them and all the different aspects. But I was not necessarily looking for a scientific career. I think it just happened by chance that when, when I got married, uh, my husband was pursuing PhD in material science. Uh, uh, in upstate New York, and just evening discussions with him, I was just so, you know, starstruck that, oh my God, you just, uh, you know, think of a problem, then you think how you can go deeper and try to use and use different tools to understand why is it happening, and that those evening discussions just inspired me to look into that, and I'm very glad I did, and I did my PhD from upstate New York, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and uh, I did it in carbon nanotubes, and I I just fell in love after that. I mean, there was no stopping it. <laughs> so, and I think it is just this evening discussions. I would say I think I give a lot of credit to my husband for that, uh, <laughs> for uh, you know clearing that path for me. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, Melissa, how was how was your path started? Um, I think it was probably marine science summer camp in about seventh grade. Um, so I attended a summer camp um, at College of Charleston. And so they took us out every day to the beach um, and to do all these kinds of environmental assays. And we even got to see baby sea turtles hatch. And I remember thinking after that, if I could do that the rest of my life, that would be cool. Mm. Um, in college, I took a few courses in physics and I thought those were interesting. And I decided to continue pursuing that. Um, but I think the real onboarding for me into um, synchrotron science particularly was the master's program um, at Stony Brook. And so that was an NSF um, initiative to increase diversity in geosciences. And it was done in collaboration with Brookhaven National Lab. And I found the program attractive really because it offered a free master's. That was the, free, that was the big thing for me. Mm. Um, and they would actually pay you for, to get the free master's. And from there, my advisor asked me to stay on for a PhD, and I thought that was a good idea, so I just kept going. 
All right, great. Well, so thank you. Now we have a, a bit of that background. So let me ask then a bit more of a, uh, frankly, just more serious question, the, the point of our conversation. Have you ever encountered a bias or discrimination and sort of atmospheres that challenged your pursuit uh, and interest in science? Um, also, and Tabitha, I guess we'll go kind of in the same order we just did. So I, I think that it depends very much on um, when you, when in your career endeavor you encounter this type of a challenging situation as to whether it has an impact on um, on your your desire to pursue the career. And so, so um, I think once you're once you're um, once you've sort of gotten into the field, uh, any of these types of adverse uh, situations, you you sort of are able to overcome them. When you're sort of, I call them baby scientists, that's what I call my students. And even, you know, the students who are still in undergraduate sites that when they're, when they're doing the, when they're actually accomplishing in the classroom and I say, okay, you guys are the baby scientists. When in, at those levels, that's when these adverse encounters can be um, somewhat um, more damaging, more more career altering, and in in ways that 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 may not be be advantageous for the for the person. So so coming to my own experiences, so um, did I, I encountered some adverse situations early on. Um, I guess I don't want to tell the very long story so that we can have time over the over the coming minutes. But I do recall um, at least I had I had come come over a few hurdles and I got into my postdoc and I was at I was a postdoc at a, a national um a, a national lab. It was actually NIST, I'll, I'll say. And and I got there early on and and my um uh, early on, it wasn't much to do as in any new job. You're kind of still getting onboarded and you're still not given a full, you don't have the full workload. So I was so excited that a seminar was happening um, that, you know, I was there bored. It was the first week or so. And since the seminar was occurring, um, I said, oh, I'll get up there and, and that'll be something fun to do. I got into the room and I was the only one there with my notebook and my pen and I was all ready to, to go and excited about the first national lab speaker seminar and the speaker comes into the room with someone else that with their host and the speaker says um oh is this this place is great and and here you have someone and by the way at them at that moment i was getting my cup of coffee maybe i should have waited for the for everyone else to be served first but i was getting my cup of coffee and the person says and you even have someone here to serve coffee the, the speaker the invited speaker says oh this is great the, your facilities are great and you even have someone here to serve coffee and i i, I sat the, the the pot down and i said you can get your own and i sat back down and so I was I was a very young scientist and the the host was very very embarrassed and 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 at the time um was was very apologetic to me later and so forth uh because of you know what the speaker did but but those are the types of things that happened that and I'll tell you that was back in 2001 in case you want to say what year it was but yeah yeah so mm. that was one of the early things that did not discourage me but I don't know like I said those things when they happen if I were the undergrad graduate or even younger, I don't know how much that would have discouraged me from the career pursuit. Oh, and the response of the of the host was also very positive. Hmm. And Suman, how would you answer that question? So, uh, I mean, I agree with what, uh, you know, Tabitha just said that if these kind of things affect you early on in your career, because at that time, you don't have much self-confidence in you, right? And someone comes here and start challenging you on uh, technical and all the things you start, it increases your self doubt. And then you start questioning yourself that are you in the right field? Are you, you know, are you smart enough and all those things? So for me, I think uh, I was very fortunate that I have very supporting family. Uh, so, you know, from coming from India, I was the first one to pursue PhD, uh, uh, you know, in any field, right? So I was kind of breaking the barriers and setting an example that it can be done and maybe encouraging other girls in my you know, extended family and whoever. So 
earlier people were asking or questioning my parents or my you know family my husband that why is she doing that what's the point you know and all those things uh, but then later on now have become an example in a good way they can say look at her if you know you should also try to go for higher studies and this so i think there is both plus and minus i did have adverse uh, i did face adverse uh, situations but i would say that i was fortunate that i have enough of support system that those were not a roadblock for me so you know i could always fall back to my network and they will say hey look at this positive side you know everyone Uh, you know not it's not girls versus boys or you know men versus women it is everyone faces these questions everyone self doubt you just have to work hard you have to just understand so i think you need to have that supporting system to overcome this kind of thing. all right thank you and uh, melissa how would you answer that question um well, i agree with simon that strong sources of support can really make a difference in those kinds of situations Um I think for me also my research was really the most helpful thing by far. Um like very early on in my career I could see uh where the research was going um and all the future applications that it would have and the opportunities that it might provide me and um other directions that I could go in. And so it was very very hard to to give that up <laughs> um just because of some sort of adversity that I'd encountered. Um but as far as adverse situations i think as a young scientist maybe that's part of it i think i'm still kind of encountering those situations even today um from grad school um i ended up requiring support from the dean of our um graduate school and he actually made a lot of situations a lot better for me and but the situation was severe enough that i actually had to reach out um for those connections and even as far as applying for postdocs i think i encountered at least one place that had no women and um no underrepresented minorities at all working there and i was walking through like i'm um, giving the inter- giving the interview and then talking about um all the work that i'd like to do and it just hits me that there's just absolutely nobody here um other than me um and so as i continue on in my career hopefully i'll be able to find the same um sources of support and hopefully be a source of support to um younger scientists um as a team. All right, thank you. Then I was going to ask if you to sort of build on that actually I'll, I'll stay with you Melissa if you could tell us a little more and then we'll go back through Suman and to Tabitha but the uh sort of next step of describing who you found as a mentor or as a support group a, a particular anecdote and thinking that really resonated with you and uh, perhaps audience members can hear this and perceive where either they could be looking for a similar kind of resource or be that kind of resource uh, uh, that would be a, a very helpful to hear but uh, still sticking with you Melissa tell us more about how you who or or what structure did you find to be a resource in in dealing with the, those kind of atmospheres um so for graduate school um i actually reached out to the grad student advocate who put me in contact with the dean of our grad school um but purely for um work purposes um one of the things i had to do was literally cold call women in the field um who i'd met at like conferences before and said they explained some of the difficulties that i was going through um and asked them hey can you sit down with me for a once a week meeting just to talk about research um and they um agreed with that and so if you actually do get cold called by somebody um maintain the connection because it really can make a difference to them hmm. um and then when i was searching for postdocs i was very very careful to like set up a situation um where i knew i'd have multiple sources of support um But yeah, really you can just reach out to people in the community. You'd be surprised about how many people are willing to like help. All right. Suman, what type of resources or or people did you find? Yeah, I mean, I I totally uh, similar to what Melissa did and I think in my uh look out for mentor or to learn or to grow, I I don't I reach out to everybody everybody who can lend a hand or can guide me right i mean it's not necessarily i'm looking for a, a solution to my research problem i'm looking for from their experience what i can learn how i can you know overcome challenges so i don't want to name the names but i was i really found a lot of resources at the place i'm working at at lbl at universities and these are all 
you know, there a lot of women, uh, it, these are all champions, right? They, they champion for you. And that is what you, you need. You need somebody to, you know, campaign for your, uh, be your champion. And then, you know, increase, help you increase your network, help you increase your visibility, help you tell that, okay, take this path, do this, and learn how to say no. All these things which, which no one taught us, right? So we, we were just, we just want to be polite. We just want to be, so I think, for me, there are a lot of mentors, and they have been with me since my grad school, uh, and uh, and all across, like women, men, every, uh, and uh, I think it is good to also like what Manisha said, just to reach out and just do cold call, and you will be surprised that people are really willing to, you know, show you the path. Hmm. All right, uh, Davida, what what kind of resources or or people did you find? Well, I guess I, I want to just re-emphasize or emphasize what the other two speakers pointed out is the importance of that counterbalance, that counter support uh, network that, that can exist, whether it's an in the moment uh, situation like the one I described earlier, or whether it's a long-term uh, situation that's so ongoing and having to reach out and find support. So uh, I guess I would say over the years, um, I've always thankfully been fortunate to have a good uh, infrastructure and support. Um, throughout throughout all the stages, whether I was a summer research student or whether I was in graduate school or postdoc, I was always able to identify people who were willing to um, take the time to, to help me with any kind of career mentoring, career guiding, and things like that. So so that that's that's such an important thing to take the time to do is what I'll emphasize. Can I jump in here? Uh, so, you know, and I think I have seen recently, uh, you know, that there is a lot of this mentor mentee programs uh, at various, and I I encourage all the new, uh, you know, career people uh, and everybody. I mean, it doesn't matter at what stage of your career to take make use of those programs. Right? You can actually apply. I mean, you can look for who you want to reach out, and don't be scared. Everyone needs this guidance. So you are not the first one and you won't be the last one, right? And like, uh, now, because of my experience, I really look forward to that. Can I pass this information to somebody who's struggling? Maybe a postdoc, maybe, and, and you know, so I think we should uh, encourage this kind of programs. And I'm very glad to see that uh, these programs are really popping up everywhere. Hmm. Great. I, I can imagine with those mentors, they would be sources for insight to the challenges. Uh, really, my next question for all of you are, what kind of obstacles or challenges would you perceive younger STEM students, perhaps those who are in high school or early college stage, uh, not quite into a uh, further postdoc stage, but the challenges that you imagine they might face uh, and, oh, in a way to share a uh, almost a heads up there can be that scenario for anybody in a career path of you don't know what you don't know and you you each could provide some insight into watch for this and right now I'm thinking really on the challenge side and then we can talk more of how there's opportunities but uh, trying to be uh, just a bit honest on hey watch out for this kind of stuff uh, what would you suggest I'll I'll open it up anyone can go first I think the stuff that they can create self-doubt. Just watch out for that. Be confident in yourself. And it is okay to not know everything. You're not supposed to know everything. It's, and, you know, just have faith in yourself and don't let the self-doubt take over. That would be my one, uh, you know, uh, advice. <laughs> Go on, Malika. Um, so for less of a challenge coming from the student side and more from... Um, something that we can maybe help with or deal we can maybe help with um, would be funding. Um, if the master's program that I attended hadn't been paid for, I don't know if I would have done it um, because I'm not sure that I, I would have been able to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky in that all of the research that I did um, as an undergrad um, was salary. Um, I also worked on carbon sequestration in undergrad and that basically paid for um, my rent and other stuff. And if it hadn't been salary, I'm not sure that I would have had time to do that in addition to a job. 
Um, so creating those opportunities where students can get paid to do research um, before you hit um, grad student and postdoc level would be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. That's great. Oh. So one of the things I would give the advice to a high school or, or younger person uh, seeking to pursue a science or engineering career is that it's, it's a practical step. Uh, into not losing confidence the way that uh, that that uh, Su Su Suman was just talking about. And the practical step is to realize that basically your science and your math is all stackable. So I'll, I'll encounter students and they'll be like, I just don't understand this. And if, this, if it's something up here that they don't understand, it's because there is one layer in the stack that they were missing. If they go back and they understand this layer, then that this will, will come to them a lot easier. And just getting that realization that um, that it's not that you just don't understand this, it's just that there is something missing inside of the curriculum either earlier in the mm. semester or a year ago or somewhere in the curriculum that if you just go ahead and focus your attention on that, then you'll stack back up and this part will come to you just like that. So that's the advice I would give is nice. realizing that stack principle. Yes, I, I, that's, that's an absolutely good point. I, mean, I think it doesn't, I, yeah, I, I will go even further, right? I mean, I'll go that to middle schooler, right? I mean, if you see girls, right? I mean, even now girls get scared of math. Why is that? When they start off, they love math and reading and English at the same level. But by the time they come to middle school, they are all of a sudden scared of math and it is too complex. And why is that? It is not that it, I think it is just because it is, this, there's a gap somewhere, right? Maybe in the teaching, maybe, and that gap builds on because math builds on on different in, in layers, right? If you don't understand this, then this is going to become challenging and this will be out of your reach. And you all of a sudden think, oh, I'm not made for that. So I think we have to really engage K to 12, you know, all the way from kindergarten to 12, if you really want to improve on STEM. We have, we don't, we can't start at, okay, let's start at college level, no. I think we have to go all the way down and make sure that for everybody, we are building these foundations very strong so that they can have career in STEM if they want in future, right? So education is a key part uh, in this whole thing. Yes. Let, let me ask you each then, knowing your, your story of how you got started in science, if you reflect now on the, the communities, the, the, the path that you each came from, imagine there's um, there's no budget restriction uh, and perhaps there's a, a open willing political atmosphere. Well, I'll, I'll start with that default. What would you recommend be, what could be some of the ways to reach out to the broader communities and engage engage their support? So it's very much what you were just starting to describe, Suman, but I'm wondering from a science advocacy position for how, where SURF comes into uh, the conversation is looking to suggest and bring up conversations and engage the civic and political and business leaders with, here are some suggestions for ways to further strengthen our scientific fabric in communities that perhaps have been less engaged. What would you what would you suggest to me if then I'm looking to go and have that conversation? Um, I'll, get I'll prompt, I'll prompt yeah. you, Tabitha. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll get started this time. Um, I really did want to uh, go back, go go forward with this idea of the stackable. Um, uh, the 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 ideas of what what's missing down one layer in the stack that presents complications later. And what I was going to say when uh, Su Su Suman was speaking was that I think there's an enormous business opportunity for help for allowing people at least at the at the high school and college age where the student is a little bit more independent to fill in those layers in the stack. And I actually don't see the um i don't see there that the, that there exists or at least not in a cost effective manner a software that the student would be able to sit at and be able to actually go through self directed tutorials go through self-directed problems and then be directed to the next layer and the next layer or either be taken back to the hypothetical layer that's probably missing for filling in this concept and, and using some AI and things like that to really help guide that. 
but not to forget that at least uh, from, from my background, making sure that the digital divide, we used to call it the digital divide. That means that what we saw in the pandemic is not every student has equal access to the computer as well as to the um, internet and things like that. So, so also coupled with that, making sure that the access is there, then I think that there can be a large, um, a large um, piece filled in that would be able to help help students um, right. to, to become users at the user facilities and eventually. Right. Uh, Melissa, what, what are your thoughts? Um, so is it more oriented towards um, business leaders or oriented towards students? I guess that's the question. I, uh, I, boy, that's, you know what, I could go with either. Let's say actually towards the business leaders. I'm thinking right now, uh, the almost outside influential communities that need to understand how they can, in essence, be more facilitating and, and be more aware of how they can be a resource. Um, so my thought would be that probably something along the lines of a research symposium that's um, aimed towards the, the type of science um, that they do. But I guess that would be very, very field specific, um, mm -hmm. like for batteries research or that kind of thing. Um, and then just inviting them to come in and see what the universities are currently working on. All right. Sumana, are there other, yeah. other kinds of outreach strategies you can, you can suggest? Yeah, so, you know, so building on what Melissa says, right? So, for example, there are two things. What, first, you have to make sure the education is strong enough, the foundation is strong enough. Second, to just tell them what is out there, right? I mean, a middle schooler might not know what we do in the science. Like, you can just say, okay, you're a scientist, right? But just to expose them, right? Bring them on. Make the schools, I mean, maybe the business model could be that, you know, some business can provide some sort of, funding to the schools so that the, they can take the kids to the, these field trips to expose them to what Google is doing, what Facebook is doing, where AI is get, uh, getting ahead. Maybe have the labs uh, in the school so that they can build the small things and small coding kind of things so that they, they get to, when they build something, anyone, all of us, right? When, when we build something, we kind of feel that we own it and that excites us that what else can we do? So these kind of programs, uh, can really help. And I think for uh, high school and I would say community college, I think we should have more internships, right? There are a mm -hmm. lot of programs like SULI and CCI and all these programs, but we should have more of these where we, I mean, I have seen in my uh, group one example uh, where a CCI student came as an intern, got so inspired changed, I mean, he also got transferred to another university and now he's working at NASA. Mm -hmm. So all just one, one exposure to science can change the life, right? So all I'm saying is that let's create more opportunities for people who don't even give them resource because let's level the field. Like, you know, Melissa said, I mean, this digital divide, you, you are just taking, if they don't have resources, they don't know what is out there. So give them resources, give them opportunities, give them platform and, and it's okay like if, if there's some layers are missing and like that was a very good point that we have to have this kind of online platform where we can just self-study, self-educate so that we don't have to feel embarrassed in open that, oh, I don't mm. know, uh, you know, 10th grade status. It's okay, you know, it's not right. your fault. Uh, typically if you're bad at something, it's, it, uh, we can say that, you know, not taught well or resources was there. Um, so I think, yeah, there, there's a lot of, things which can be done uh, in this space. All right. Let me then put a, almost a, a little further point on it. Uh, could you remind the audience in your answer, the user facility or facilities that you've worked with and what kind of strategies do you perceive perhaps could be implemented to ensure that there is the outreach and the engagement to more, uh, say, lesser involved communities uh, or otherwise the sort of uh, groups that you think should be involved that aren't as involved right now. Well, um, if you were helping to shape the process, the protocol at user facilities, what might you suggest? Um, okay. So I guess I can go first. <laughs> yes. Um, I have used Brookhaven um, National Lab. I've used um, Argon 
in, in Chicago. And I've used LCLS um, and the facility in Germany. And I think that, oh, um, also Oak Ridge. <laughs> I think that's it. Um, I think the hardest part or the biggest challenge for um, uh, new researchers to this particular field um, is to learn how to apply and to get time um, and like all the requirements that the specific facility is going to have. Um, I know for one of the facilities that um, I've been using, um, it's the dynamic compression sector at Argonne National Lab. Um, they actually require the users to come in or any new user to come in um, for at least two days of training to demonstrate um, the ability to actually build the targets. And something that would be really, really, really helpful for their facility um, would be to um, conduct some kind of school for new users um, so that new users can actually see all of this um, equipment being assembled and can see all of their requirements and can maybe get some kind of tutorial on proposal writing. Um, because I think unless you've been a user there, it's actually fairly hard to get time. And I think that's probably true for the vast majority of the places that I've used. Mm. All right. Uh, Suman, what type of engagement strategies would you like to see so implemented? It, so I think more outreach, right? If if people don't, so I have been a user of Molecular Foundry uh, uh, here at uh, Berkeley Lab for a long time. And so I think maybe, you know, of course, this how to access this facility through uh, proposal writing and just outreach so that people are aware that this facility exists for free of charge and they can come and do science, right? So I think more uh, targeted outreach to uh, these, you know, communities who have, you know, the, who don't know uh, that you know this kind of facilities exist and what what are the features in there? Maybe going to the colleges, community colleges, and telling them that okay, this facility exists. We have all these facilities. Having more tours of the site so that they know what exists there. And I think that they have started to do uh, some of this effort. Uh, I'm a member of user executive committee at uh, Molecular Foundry, and we organize uh, uh, in the annual meeting one. Uh, symposium on uh, diversity, equity, and energy justice. And we did invite people uh, who have been working in this field to learn from them that how can we help in this outreach? So, so I, I think it has to be a very focused effort. Like we, uh, we have to work on it. It will not happen by itself. Hmm. So, so it, it, it ha you have to keep in mind that it cannot be an add-on thing. It should be in a thought process. When we when we hire, when we do any research, we should think how it's gonna uh, you know bring energy justice or environmental justice. So it, we have to, as a researcher, change our thinking process. That we have to bring everybody together, keep everybody together, and move forward with everybody, all with everyone. You know, no one left behind. And I think user facilities have to start putting more focus on uh, the outreach activities for uh, you know the underserved communities okay uh tabitha what would you say well it's funny that you're so i agree with with both melissa and suman um and it's funny that your acronym for the organization is surf because i always used to say when i first became a user at a user facility that it's like surfing that if you live near the near the the ocean you learn how to surf but if you're one of the inlanders and you don't live near it you don't learn much about it and that's what a little bit of the uh, user facility experience is like it's um, so I've used um, uh, Advanced Photon Source, um, uh, NSLS2 at Brookhaven National Lab, and uh, there in when I was a faculty member in Louisiana, there is a synchrotron at LSU called uh, CAMD, Center for Advanced Microstructures and Devices. Mm -hmm. That was a large part of my de decision to uh, uh, to apply and accept the faculty position so so far from my own roots where I had grown up. But um, but the point of this idea is is that one of the things that the user facilities can do is try to break that um, geographic barrier because I do think that um, it it may not it may be breaking down over the years but I think it's still pretty strong of a barrier and um, so so now that we have 
uh, remote access, we have remote use, we have uh, webinars like this one that just wasn't so prevalent a decade ago. Uh, I think we can be doing a, a bit more to involve people in the, the user facilities science that are not proximity to those facilities. So that's one idea that I would share. And I hope I get a chance to share my second idea with your next question. So thank oh, you. Oh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, then we were sort of ex expanding out then and a bit of wondering um, and and perceiving the audience members and younger scientists would be intrigued to know uh, after uh, some years of experience you, with user facilities and the different research realms you've been involved in, what is now prompting your curiosity? What is is kind of next on your radar that you're aspiring to learn more about. Uh, and I like the the question that Abram prompted you all on was, what makes you unique? So uh, Tabitha, I can see you're, you're ready to answer this one. So you go first. I'm going to answer what makes me unique uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and not what's, what's my next thing. Mm -hmm. This is something I've been doing for a very long time, which is taking my students, my undergraduate students to the user facilities and the synchrotrons. So I've been at uh, smaller institutions uh, for, for nearly my whole career. Rowan is growing and we're aiming towards the R1 quite rapidly now, but, but I've had a long Long career behind me. And so my, a large portion of my research has been done with undergraduate um, students. And I can just tell you that it's amazingly eye-opening for those students to go to the to go to the user facility, to have access to the state-of-the-art um, state-of-the-art instrumentation, and then to be able to drive that instrumentation while they measure samples that they prepared back at home. It's just very, it's very revolutionary for the students. It's very eye-opening and it gives them a, a level where of, of um, staying power in this in the sciences, I think, that that other experiences back at back only at the home lab might not. Not be able to give them, and so that's that's where I would say I, I find a, a unique uh, spot in this in this um, area. Nice, uh, uh, Simon. How about to you? What what would you like to describe about yourself and your interests now? Uh, so you know, I mean, the project which uh, I'm very excited about is to make these buildings. I'm going to get a bit specific make this energy storage for buildings uh, so that we all you know can have more resilient buildings and uh, so this is what excites me for research and what i think the unique uh, in aspect of uniqueness i would say this thing that i can do research and i also i can believe that you know my work can have a small impact towards this climate change and i can help the communities and i can also do my part to make sure there is energy justice and equity that excites me that my work can impact and then I and I have freedom to if I want to like to that get undergrad students and then show them how exciting it is as interns I can do that so all those things that that freedom excites me all right what would you say Melissa what should we know about you uh, um, even more <laughs> So I think the thing that makes me unique, um, so I should say partially it's a little bit self-serving because I'm applying for faculty jobs now. <laughs> but <laughs> um, my interest in regional equity, I think. Um, so I'm originally from South Carolina and I really hadn't heard of synchrotron science like at all um, until I pretty much left for grad school um, to do work at Brookhaven. And so one of my big interests is um, bringing synchrotron science and access to synchrotron science um, to my home region, I guess, um, to the South, um, where there are a lot of um, underrepresented minority students. Um, I was particularly interested in um, working with students from historically black colleges and um, ones who would be, or in faculty members who would be interested in collaborating with me at whatever university I end up at um, from historically black colleges and providing them with the opportunities to um, pursue further research with the DOE, uh, because I'm really, really grateful that I ran into this opportunity, and I really think that other people should have the chance to see it too. Um, and just because you're from <laughs> the middle of nowhere, deep south, um, doesn't mean that that shouldn't be an opportunity that um, they get. All right. 
you know, with a few more minutes left, let me ask you another question that uh, I, I know you may not have uh, been prepared for it, but it really gets into that both aspirational and inspirational aspect of, of your research and who you each are. I'm curious if there's a leader within any of the given user facility or perhaps university networks that you've worked in or that you are just aware of who you see really exemplifies an awareness and a manifestation of the diversity, equity, inclusion zeitgeist that we're seeing happen, uh, I'd, I'd like to think, uh, naturally and progressively through society, but also strategically and intentionally. Who do you see as as really being a voice for and a, a strategic force for bringing more diversity, equity, inclusion themes into our user facility network? Um, and I know I'm so ca catching you off guard, but really looking for, who, in a way, almost, who's your... Who's your hero, if I could use such a strong word in that in that realm? Uh, and with that big prompt, I'll I'll wait for whoever wants to speak first. <laughs> I'll I'll go ahead and get started. And I want to mention the a network is called the Increase Network, and it was formed by uh, Sakaze Matingua. It is an organization that works with uh, faculty members at MSIs, HBCUs, HSIs to help them to connect with um, with user facilities and with national labs. Um, they ran a series of workshops at Brookhaven National Labs, uh, funded by a National Science Foundation in years past, and they continue to uh, cohort the faculty members who are in the network and keep them updated and informed about the ongoing um, research opportunities uh, at at the at the user facilities and at national labs. So I would say that network increase is is um, is a is a a one network that I can. Uh, point to uh, specifically. Nice. All right. Thank you. Uh, Suman, how about you? I think I'm going to pass this question to Melissa. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Melissa, go ahead. Melissa, um, all right. Who Abram. comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Abram, who invited all of us to, <laughs> to come. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So... Uh, uh, Dr. Abram Ledbetter, uh, he's he, he's being very humble and uh, is <laughs> is not part of the panel, but is a, also a, a force for uh, prompting these conversations and also really getting into some of the mechanics of of how DEI protocols can it can really grow and uh, I don't know, like have an impact that we're all looking to see. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think if I have to say something, I think collectively this focus on idea or DEI, the equity is really helping, right? Because now we have starting to have the conversation. I, I think five years back, I, I was not thinking so much about equity or environmental justice or, you know, inclusion, diversity, but now every every research project I write, I have to think how it's gonna impact. So I think if I have to choose a hero, it is this vision that we started, uh, I think that 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 has inspired all of us to think about it at very different levels. Uh, okay, well, as intended with this first conversation here, this this panel, and in speaking with Abram and conversations amongst the board of directors with Surf, this theme is very much top of mind, and we would look to continue this conversation and bring in additional uh, either it could be lab leadership specific researchers, uh, other thought leaders that you think should be in this conversation through a series of webinars in 2023. Thank you all for making time today to have this conversation and our audience, I appreciate your time and your interest in this. Uh, we will look to build on it in 2023 with further conversations, uh, both the convenience of Zoom and gathering this way as you would like describing Tabitha, but also in person as we may be able to gather at conferences that uh, people uh, just happen to also be at or that we arrange born of some surf activities as well. So thanks everyone, really appreciate your time. Look forward to talking with you again in person.
Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. All right. I'm Melissa. Yes. Have You're welcome. Yes, nice to meet you all. And thanks, everyone. We will be starting another session in just a few minutes. I'll see you online shortly.